Are you struggling to turn your readers into loyal fans? Would doing this and building a community around your work be a game changer for your business? Then stay tuned to this episode of the Author Switch Podcast because I will be sharing the things that you can do to lead your readers on a journey to becoming raving fans. Are you an entrepreneur, small business owner, or consultant looking to boost your authority, influence, and impact? The Author Switch Podcast with best-selling, award-winning author Karma Spence is your answer. Tune in for actionable advice, powerful strategies, and engaging interviews to turn on your author switch and take your business to the next dimension. The Author Switch. Hello, and welcome to the Author Switch Podcast. I'm your host, Karma Spence, and I help executive coaches, business leaders, and consultants write, publish, and market their client-attracting books so that they can grow their businesses. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about how to build a loyal audience and basically give you some key steps that you can take to not only turn your readers into loyal fans, but lead them on a journey that they enjoy going on to get there. So first, I want to talk about audience psychology. Every audience is different depending on what topic they're following. So you need to dive into what makes them tick. What are their pain points? Why are they going after this information? Why are they interested in this information? And what are their aspirations? What are they trying to achieve? Now, in general, a nonfiction audience are usually driven by achievement and success. These audiences are highly driven by the desire to achieve goals. They want to reach new levels of success. They want to be recognized as leaders in their field. Your content, if it's it's business content, can reinforce their ability to succeed and provides them with actionable steps to achieve their ambitions. This kind of content resonates deeply with them. Now, if you are doing some other kind of content, there might be a, a different twist there. And there are ways to do this research so they understand, but I'm giving you examples of what a typical business audience is. Your audience may be different. Another audience driver is empowerment and control. Professionals often seek to feel in control of their careers, businesses, and decisions. They are drawn to content that empowers them to take decisive action and provides them with tools and strategies to maintain and enhance their control. Now, yes, in many ways, control is an illusion, but feeling like you're not out of control and and chaos is ensuing is really important. And if your information can help them with that, you can build that loyal audience. Many people who follow business information are interested in growth and learning. They want to continuously improve. That is a core value for these audiences. They are motivated by opportunities for personal and professional growth, and content that challenges them to expand their knowledge, skills, and capabilities is highly appealing. Another point that business audiences have in common is status and recognition. Prestige and respect of peers and clients are important. It may not be the most important, but it is there. It is there. In fact, in my audience, often the unspoken motivation to become an author is this this little tiny voice that says, wouldn't it be cool to be a celebrity? Because authors often are. But there's that status and recognition that comes with being an author, which is often a motivator. Usually not the prime motivator, but it's usually there. If your content can help someone elevate their status, showcase their expertise, or gain recognition within their industry, it can strongly trigger engagement with your content. And finally, and this is a common need because it's part of the hierarchy of needs, and that is security and stability. Despite their drive for success, these audiences also value content that offers reassurance and strategies for maintaining stability whether it's financial security, business sustainability, or career longevity. So once you have an understanding 
of the basic psychology that's driving people to consume your content, you can start developing a reader persona that you can write to. This will help you understand your audience better and you can have more than one persona. But having a persona helps focus you so that you're not thinking, I'm writing to a crowd. No, because when people read your content, they are one person. Write to one person. You're speaking to that person right there. When you write content that speaks to one person, not y'all, then your content is stronger and resonates more deeply with those readers. Even though they may be a member of a community, they are still one person when they're reading your content. And the thing is, part of the reason why community is so important in a business, and it's becoming more so, is because people have a need to belong. I believe this is also in the hierarchy of needs. They want that sense of community and belonging. And if you can provide that around your work, you will fulfill that psychological need for connection, making them more likely to become loyal fans. So for example, Lady Gaga is a really good example, even though she's not an author. She actually has a pet name for her followers. She calls them little monsters. Not that I go for that kind of thing, but the people who are her fans love it. And back when Firefly was on television, fans of the show called themselves brown coats because the people in the TV show wore brown coats. And I remember there was a podcast that was called Brown Coats that was all about Firefly. And people who love Star Trek often call themselves Trekkers. And it's like people love this sense of belonging, like they belong to something bigger than themselves. And yes, it can be something geeky and fun, or it can be something important. Either way, people love to have that feeling of belonging. And so if you can foster that with your content, you will turn your readers into loyal fans. So once you understand your reader psychology, you want to create a fan journey. And the way you do this is you map out your ideal journey for a reader from discovering your work all the way to becoming a loyal fan. And this map helps you figure out how to guide them along that path. So it all starts with awareness and interest. You start by understanding how are readers first discovering your work? And you want to make this strong initial impression. So you want to capture their attention and pique their interest. But that first means you need to understand where are they first discovering you? Some of them will discover you on Amazon. So you want to make sure that your footprint on Amazon is strong. I did an entire episode on that and I will put a link to that in the show notes. If they discover you by your website, again, you want to have a really strong homepage. If you want information on that, you can check out my book, Home Sweet Homepage. I also have lots of information on my website. I will put links to articles in the show notes about how to get a strong homepage. Those are the two most common places that people get introduced to your work. But if you know of other places, you just want to make sure that those places where people are most likely to first discover you, which could also be on social media, are representing you well and compellingly so that people will go, hmm. I want to follow this person and go deeper into the fan journey. They're not thinking I want to go into the fan journey, but they think they want to follow you more. And therefore, they take their first step into the fan journey that you've planned out. Now, the second step is engagement and connection. You want to engage with your fans early on. And you can use tools like newsletters, blog posts, social media to do this. But basically what you're trying to do in this engagement and connection is one, fostering that, that sense of we, we are kindred spirits. You want to be in my world because I get you and you want them to engage with your content. That means you want them to comment on your blog posts. You want them to like and comment and share your social media posts. You want them to engage with your content in some manner. And I will get into how you measure that in the second half of the podcast. The third step is to build trust and credibility. You've gotten their attention and got them interested in with you. You've started to engage with them. Now you need to show them that you are trustworthy and that you are credible. You can do this, number one, by building a following because the following is a trust indicator. 
But you can also post trust indicators. You can share testimonials, share case studies, share seals that say that you've been vetted, share certifications that you've earned, share degrees that you've earned. All these things say that you're credible and that you're trustworthy. And the more third-party people who can say, yes, this person knows their stuff, the better. So now the next step is to foster commitment. You want to guide your readers to convert their interest into action. And this can be purchasing a book, subscribing to a newsletter, participating in a webinar. Basically, you start with micro commitments, easy yeses, like, would you like this newsletter if I give you this opt-in gift? That's a, that's a quick, easy yes. Would you like to attend this webinar? That's a little bit higher value, yes, but it's still a relatively easy yes because it doesn't cost anything. Once you've gotten them consuming some free stuff, then you want to get them to put some skin in the game. So that's when you make a usually a low ticket offer, something that's anywhere between $10 and $27. It's an easy yes for something of value that moves them closer to becoming a paying customer for higher ticket items. And the thing is, is once they have paid you a small amount of money, they're more likely to pay you a large amount of money. Now they may not move from a $27 item to a $5,000 service or consulting or whatever, but they may go into something that's $500. You wanna have a suite of offers that are various price points and you wanna have that trigger, that trigger one that gets them started. Again, if you're dealing with a different type of audience, their first buy with you might be high ticket. It really depends on what you're offering and who you're offering it to. Know your audience to know how to get them to go from, I'm reading your book to I'm paying you money. The next step is to create advocates. This turns your committed readers into advocates who spread the word about your work. You can do this officially through referral programs, affiliate programs, but better yet are the ones where people spontaneously do that. So for example, many years ago, I read John Franklin's Writing for Story. To this day, I still refer people to that book because I really, really like that book. I have become an advocate of John Franklin's book. In fact, I've also endorsed other people that I've taken courses from. Years ago, I took courses from them, but I was so impressed by what they helped me do. I still say, yeah, check that person out. In fact, last episode, I talked about Adam Urbanski because I think he's awesome. And I haven't worked with him in years, but he's still awesome. <laughs> I've just gone in a different direction. That's all. But when you can create advocates because they got engaged with your work and they love what you do. That is the golden ticket because advocates create new fans who eventually may or may not become an advocate themselves. The next step is cultivating long-term loyalty. You want to maintain and strengthen the relationships with your readers over time. Now you can do this by offering exclusive content, like subscribe to my newsletter and you'll get content that I don't put anywhere else or join this low cost membership and I, I give you content that I give to no one else. You can do personalized communication, which is becoming easier and easier with AI to do that in different ways. And you can create VIP experiences that people can participate in, like retreats, or specialized webinars or summits and things like that that are smaller audience, higher price, higher touch with you. These are VIP experiences. They can even be one-on-one. -on -one. And finally, the last stage is sustaining the fan journey. You want to create all these touch points so that people, whenever people come into your world, they are led on this fan journey and what you're hoping is that the most people who come in contact with you and decide they like you, that first step, will eventually become a long-term fan. Kind of like I am of John Franklin's book, Writing for Story. So after the break, I'm going to be talking about how do you measure 
the success of all these efforts. Do you have a great book but struggle with getting it noticed? Many authors feel lost when it comes to marketing their book effectively. You've put your heart and soul into writing your book, but without a solid marketing plan, it's like shouting into the void. The frustration of low sales and limited visibility can be disheartening. Introducing Serve Up Your Book, the ultimate guide to mastering book marketing. This comprehensive guide helps you lay the foundations before you start writing, ensuring your marketing efforts are built on a solid base. Build your audience while you write, creating a loyal following ready to support your launch. Generate a pre-launch buzz with proven strategies that create excitement and anticipation. Launch your book with impact, turning your release into a major event. Continue marketing your book after the launch, keeping the momentum going and expanding your reach. Filled with actionable insights and practical advice, Serve Up Your Book is designed to help you achieve lasting success. Don't let your book go unnoticed. Serve up your book by Karma Spence. Available now on Amazon. Hello, and welcome back to the Author Switch Podcast. I am your host, Karma Spence, and I help executive coaches, business leaders, and consultants write, publish, and market their client attracting books so that they can grow their businesses. Before the break, I talked about the fan journey. I talked about reader psychology and then how to lead someone through a fan journey so that they be go from, hmm, this is an interesting book, to being a fan who advocates your work to others. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about building community and how you do that. And then I'm going to go into how you can measure the things that you're doing so that you know you have a successful program. So first, building community. The first key of building a community is creating a dedicated space for interaction. This can be as simple as a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group, but it can also become an elaborate or not so elaborate paid membership site. But basically you want to create a space where all the people who like your work can gather, talk about it, build relationships with themselves, build relationship with you and your work. This helps foster engagement. And a way you can do that is only people in this group get this particular kind of content. For example, in my Facebook group, I've stopped doing this because there's such a huge library that every day of the week I provided either a meditation, a writing prompt, top tips on how to do your book. The library is there. Only members of the Facebook group get that information at this point. I might take some of it and turn it into a book, but honestly, the vast majority of it is only going to be available to the people who are in my Facebook group. There'll be a link to that group in the show notes if you want to join. It's called the Author Switch Club, and it's on Facebook. You want to encourage reader interaction. That therefore you want to ask questions, do Q and A sessions, have polls, get people commenting on your posts. Now I know that this can be very hard, but it is doable. And the more successful you get at it, the more successful you are at it, because interaction breeds interaction. You want to be consistent and present. Regularly engage with your community post updates, respond to comments, participate in discussions. Your active presence helps maintain the momentum and shows your readers that you're invested in the community. And here's a pro tip, recognize and reward loyalty. Acknowledge your most active and loyal community members with shout outs, special titles, rewards, this not only encourages continued participation, but also fosters a sense of belonging and anticipation. Now, how do you find out how this is all working? The first step is to listen to your audience. Actively seek feedback. Is this working for you? In fact, one reason why I switched out how I was posting in my Facebook group is because I got feedback that what I was doing was overwhelming because I literally was posting seven days a week. And people were just like, I, and they would turn it off because it was just too much. So now I post three times a week, which is a much more manageable thing. And I have noticed an uptick in community engagement since I've done that. So listen to your audience. Your audience may love seven times a week. They may love five times a week. They may prefer once a week. Listen to your audience. Seek feedback. And then also 
what kind of content do they want? Turned out they didn't really want the meditation so much. So I stopped offering that. Monitor your social media and community channels. Pay attention to what your audience is saying about your work across social media platforms, forums, and comment sections. Engage with them by responding to comments and participating in discussions to show that you are listening. Now, the best way I found to do that is to have a Google alert with your name on it. Now, lots of times what comes through on that Google alert is content I've already posted. That's fine. But every once in a while, a thing will pop up in that feed that says, someone mentioned me. When that happens, I go to where they mentioned me and I comment or I like or I post. For example, just the other day on Mondays, I go live with Coffee with Karma on LinkedIn. And on that particular day, I did a really fun, energetic episode, all based on the TV show Ultraman. Book advice based on Ultraman. And I had a little action figure that I bring up every time I said Ultraman, and I had a lot of fun. Someone not only shared that to their own profile, but they shared it to a group that we are mutually in. That was golden. So I went to both those posts and I commented differently thanking her for sharing and adding a question to get a conversation going. This is how you build engagement. Watch for people mentioning your stuff and then reward them for doing that. And you'd be surprised, just a comment or a like, because it helps them in their algorithm, that is a reward. You want to implement a feedback loop. You want to create a system for collecting, analyzing, and acting on feedback. Share with your audience how their input has influenced your decisions or content, reinforcing that their voice matters. Again, this Google alert can help, but if you ever change your mind about how you're doing something because of something an audience member said, give them a shout out. Say, hey, you know, thanks to my reader so-and-so, I decided to do this thing differently. It makes them feel cool and warm and fuzzy that, hey, they helped you out. But it also signals to other people that, hey, if I give her a suggestion, she might follow it too and give me a shout out, which breeds engagement. When you can, personalize your responses. When you address your feedback, personalize your response to show that you genuinely consider what that person has said. This helps build trust and makes your audience feel heard and appreciated. So for example, in that post, I said, thank you, her name for blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I asked her, so I, and she made a comment about me being in flow or something. I said, yeah, I really enjoyed that. What did you like best? Or yeah, I was in flow because of this. How have you been in flow? I mean, I engaged with her comment. So it wasn't just like me going like, <laughs> and then moving on about my business. I engaged with what she had to say. And as you receive feedback, you want to adapt and evolve based on that feedback. Now, sometimes you will get feedback that's bogus. That happens. But what I've often found is that when someone gives feedback or advice that's off, that, that's like you didn't get what I was saying, that says more about me not communicating what I was saying very well than it does about them not getting what I'm saying. You have to kind of like read between the lines. Is it that this person just wasn't clued in? Or was it that I was not clear enough to help that person clue in? Now I'm going to share with you some things that you can measure so that you can know whether your strategy is working or not. Now you can have the option. You can take notes furiously or you can download this free report that will be in the show notes. And all you need to do is give me your email address. That's all. And you'll get this free report. So the first thing you want to measure is audience growth rate. This metric tracks the increase in the number of followers, subscribers, or community members over a specific period of time. It helps you understand how quickly your audience is expanding. The best way to monitor this is to take a snapshot, not literally a snapshot, but like have an Excel sheet that says, these are all my platforms. This is my audience on this date. And then depends on how fast you think you're growing. You can enter that information again once a week, once a month, once a quarter. And what you see is like, is this audience growing or is it a trident? 
you know, is it getting smaller, growing fast? Is it growing slow? Then what you want to do is look at what content for the ones that grew fast, look at the content that you're doing there. What's working? What's working? So the next metric, which will help you understand what's working is your engagement rate. This measures the level of interaction your content receives, including likes, comments, shares, clicks. It's often expressed as a percentage of total followers or viewers, indicating how actively your audience is engaging with your content. Now, again, you can have a spreadsheet that says, I posted this content on this day. By this day, I had this many likes, this many shares, this many comments. That's something you can do. You can do that daily, weekly. I wouldn't do it more than weekly, honestly, that one, because that one, after a certain period of time, people stop engaging it unless, and here's a trick. If you go to your Facebook memories and you simply like one of your old posts or comment on one of your posts, like an update, you know, five years ago I did this and gee, I'm still loving it or whatever. That brings it up in other people's feed and suddenly you'll get more comments and likes from people who didn't see it before and didn't engage with it before they're now engaging with it. So you can increase engagement over time. So don't like it right away. Wait a few weeks, like it then and increase engagement. The next metric you want to look at is retention rate. This metric shows how well you're maintaining your audience over time. A high retention rate means that people who join your community or subscribe to your content are staying engaged rather than dropping off. Now, you may not be able to tell, okay, Joe Blow subscribed at this point. He still subscribed at this point. He unsubscribed at that point. But what you can do is if your numbers are growing, people are probably staying. If your numbers are dropping, people are probably not staying <laughs> and your retention rate is low. So retention rate, there's a formula for that. And that is in this free guide right here that you can get for all you need to do is give me your email address and you get this free guide. It gives you all these metrics and gives you the formula on how to collect it and gives you an example. The next one you want to look at is conversion rate. This measures the percentage of your audience that takes a desired action, such as signing up for a newsletter, purchasing a book, or registering for a webinar. It helps assess how effectively you're turning interest into concrete actions. And what you also might want to look at is how does your conversion rate compare to industry standards? So like, I'm just going to pull numbers. I don't have exact. These are not exact numbers. I'm just going to pull numbers. Let's say the industry subscription rate to a newsletter is 2%. If you can get more than 2% of people subscribing to your newsletter, you're doing really well. If you can at least get 2%, at least you're doing as well as everybody else. If it's less than that, then maybe you need to switch things out. That's why you want to look at industry benchmarks for whatever conversion rate you're looking at so that you can tell how well you're doing and whether you need to start tweaking things to increase your conversion rate. The next metric that you want to look at is average session duration. This is for websites or online platforms, and it indicates how much time users are spending on your content. The longer the session durations usually suggest higher interest levels, higher engagement levels. The best way to do this so for, for your website is get a plugin that does it for you. And it, basically it connects, usually it connects to Google Analytics and it does it all for you. And you can see your little charts. I have several of those plugins in my WordPress site. So I'm able to know, okay, when people download my podcast, which day of the week is the most, most downloads, which days of the week have the fewest downloads. And that helps me understand, okay, did I promote it on that day? Did I not? Are they waiting? There's also a plugin that tells me which pages on my site are getting the longest duration, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to figure it out yourself. There are plugins that'll do this for you. But it, there, I also have in this guide a way to figure it out. And I give examples. The next metric you want to look at is content sharing rate. 
this basically tracks how often is your content shared by your audience and on social media platforms, which helps engage virality and the reach of your content. Some people get really high share, share rates. Some people don't. Some posts get higher share rates than others. There's a couple of things you're looking at. Number one is how often is the content shared and what kind of your content is more likely to get shared. So content that gets a higher share rate, you want to do more of that content because that gets your message out to more people because they're sharing it. Click-through rate is another metric you want to take a look at. This metric measures the percentage of people who click on a link, ad, or call to action in your content. It's crucial for understanding the effectiveness of your marketing efforts and engagement strategies. Most email programs will automatically measure this. The problem with that is that they're not always 100% accurate because I send out emails that have no call to action. They're just inspirational and informational and I'll get a click-through rate. There's nothing to click on. So what I think it's measuring is people opening it and it gets that little pixel. So email click-through rates are helpful, but don't live and die by them because sometimes they're not terribly accurate, but they give you something to look at. If things are improving, that's better. It doesn't matter whether it's accurately doing it or not. The important thing is that pe more people are engaging. There are, again, for websites, if you have a WordPress website, there are plugins that will monitor click-through rates on buttons and links and things like that. You want to monitor that stuff. And then the final metric you want to take a look at is your net promoter score. This metric measures the likelihood that your audience would recommend your content to others, providing insight into overall satisfaction and potential for organic growth through word of mouth. And there is a way to calculate it, and you can get that in this guide for free. And all you have to do is give me your email address. <laughs> so there you go. That's how you build a loyal fan base and use that fan base to create your own author success. This is Karma Spence saying ciao for now. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Author Switch podcast. If you enjoyed today's show and want to support its mission, here's how to help. First, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. Your engagement helps my channel grow and reach more aspiring and established authors. Your ratings and reviews are invaluable. They help me reach more listeners and continue delivering top-notch content. To catch up on past episodes, including those no longer available on podcast platforms, visit authorswitch.com forward slash episodes. There, you can choose to watch or listen to your favorite episodes at your convenience. If you'd like to show additional support, consider dropping a tip in the tip jar at buymeacoffee.com forward slash karma spence. Your contributions help keep the podcast running and are greatly appreciated. Thank you for being a part of the Author Switch community. Until next time, keep writing.